Night, chapter four. The camp looked as though it had been through an epidemic, empty and dead. Only a few well-dressed inmates were wandering between the blocks. Of course, we first had to pass through the showers. The head of the camp joined us there. He was a stocky man with big shoulders, the neck of a bull, thick lips, and curly hair. He gave an impression of kindness. From time to time, a smile would linger in his gray-blue eyes. Our convoy included a few 10- and 12-year-olds. The officer took an interest in them and gave orders to bring them food. We were given new clothing and settled in two tents. We were to wait there until we could be incorporated into work, commandos. Then we would be assigned to a block. In the evening, the commandos returned from the workyards. Roll call. We began looking for people we knew, asking the veterans which work commandos were the best and which block, which block one should try to an enter. All the inmates agreed. Buna is a very good camp. One can hold one's own here. The most important thing is not to be assigned to the construction commando, as if we had a choice. Our tent leader was a German, an assassin's face, fleshy lips, hands resembling a wolf's paws. The camp's food had agreed with him. He could hardly move, he was so fat. Like the head of the camp, he liked children. Immedi immediately after our arrival, he had bread brought from them, some soup and margarine. In fact, this affection was not entirely altruistic. There existed here a veritable traffic of children among the homosexuals, I learned later. He told us, you will stay with me for three days in quarantine. Afterward, you will go to work. Tomorrow, medical checkup. One of his aides, a tough looking boy with shifty eyes, came over to me. Would you like to get into a good commando? Of course, but on one condition. I want to stay with my father. All right, he said. I can arrange it. For a pittance. Your shoes. I'll give you another pair. I refused to give him my shoes. They were all I had left. I'll also give you a ration of bread with some margarine. He liked my shoes. I would not let him have them. Later, they were taken from me anyway, in exchange for nothing that time. The medical checkup took place outside, early in the morning before three doctors seated on a bench. The first hardly examined me. He just asked, are you in good health? Who would have dared to admit the opposite? On the other hand, the dentist seemed more conscientious. He asked me to open my mouth wide. In fact, he was not looking for decay, but for gold teeth. Those who, those who had gold in their mouths were listed by their number. I did have a gold crown. The first three days went by quickly. On the fourth day, as we stood in front of our tent, the capos appeared. Each one began to choose the men he liked. You, you, you. They pointed their fingers the way one might choose cattle or merchandise. We followed our capo, a young man. He made his halt at the door of the first block, near to the entrance of the camp. This was the orchestra's block. He motioned us inside. We were surprised. What had we to do with music? The orchestra was playing a military march, always the same. Dozens of commandos were marching off in step to the workyards. The capos were beating the time. Left, right, left, right. SS officers, pen in hand, recorded the number of men leaving. The orchestra continued to play the same march until the last commando had passed. Then the conductor's baton stopped moving and the orchestra fell silent. The capo yelled, fall in. We fell into ranks of five with the musicians. We left the camp without music, but in step. We still had the march in our ears. Left, right, left, right. We uh, struck up conversations with our neighbors, the musicians. Almost all of them were Jews. Juliak, a pole with eyeglasses and a cynical smile in a pale face. Luis, a native of Holland, a well-known violinist. He complained that they would not let him play Beethoven. Jews were not allowed to play German music. Hans, the young man from Berlin, was full of wit. The foreman was a Pole. Franek, a former student in Warsaw. Juliak explained to me, we work in a warehouse of electrical materials not far from here. The work is neither difficult nor dangerous. Only Eidek the Kapo occasionally has fits of madness, and then you'd better stay out of his way. You were lucky, little fellow, said Hans, smiling. You fell into a good commando. Ten minutes later, we stood in front of the warehouse. A German employee, a civilian, the Meister, came to meet us. He paid as much attention to us as would a shopkeeper receiving a delivery of old rags. Our comrades were, white, were right. The work was not difficult. Sitting on the ground, we counted bolts, bulbs, and various small electrical parts. The Kappa launched into a lengthy explanation of the importance of this work, warning us that anyone who proved to be lazy would, not be, would be held accountable. My new comrades assured, reassured me. Don't worry, he has to say this because of the Meister. There were many Polish civilians here and a few French women as well. The women silently greeted the musicians with their eyes. Franek the foreman assigned me to a corner. Don't kill yourself, there's no hurry, but watch out, don't let an SS call you. Please, sir, I'd like to be near my father. All right, your father will work here next to you. We were lucky. Two boys came to join our group. 
Yossi and Tibi, two brothers from Czechoslovakia whose parents had been exterminated in Birkenau. They lived for each other, body and soul. They quickly became my friends. Having once belonged to a Zionist youth organization, they knew countless Hebrew songs. And so we would sometimes hum melodies evoking the gentle waters of the Jordan River and the majestic sanctity of Jerusalem. We also often spoke, we also spoke often about Palestine. Their parents, like mine, had not had the courage to sell everything and emigrate while there was still time. We decided that if we were allowed to live until the liberation, we would not stay another day in Europe. We would board the first ship to Haifa. Still lost in his Kabbalistic dreams, a Kiba drummer had discovered a verse from the Bible which, translated into numbers, made it possible for him to predict redemption in the weeks to come. We had left the tents for the musician's block. We now were entitled to a blanket, a washbowl, and a bar of soap. The Black Altiste was a German Jew. It was good to have a Jew as your leader. His name was Alphonse, a young man with a startling, startlingly wizened face. He was totally devoted to defending his block. Whenever he could, he would organize a cauldron of soup for the young, for the weak, for all those who dreamed more of an extra portion of food than of liberty. One day, when we had just returned from the warehouse, I was summoned by the block secretary. A-7713, that's me. After your meal, you'll go to see the dentist. But I don't have a toothache. After your meal, without fail. I went to the infirmary block. Some 20 prisoners were waiting in line at the entrance. It didn't take long to learn the reason for our summons. Our gold teeth were to be extracted. The dentist, a Jew from Czechoslovakia, had a face not unlike a death mask. When he opened his mouth, one had a ghastly vision of yellow, rotten teeth. Seated in the chair, I asked me meekly, What are you going to do, sir? I shall remove your gold crown, that's all, he said, clearly indifferent. I thought of pretending to be sick. Couldn't you wait a few days, sir? I don't feel well. I have a fever. He wrinkled his brow, thought for a moment, and took my pulse. All right, son, come back to me when you feel better, but don't wait for me to call you. I went back I went back to see him a week later, with the same excuse. I still was not feeling well. He did not seem surprised, and I don't know whether he believed me. Yet he most likely was pleased that I had come back on my own, as I had promised. He granted me a further delay. A few days after my visit, the dentist's office was shut down. He had been thrown into prison and was about to be hanged. It appeared that he had been dealing in the prisoner's gold teeth for his own benefit. I felt no pity for him. In fact, I was pleased with what was happening to him. My gold crown was safe. It could be useful to me one day to buy something, some bread, or even time to live. At that moment in time, all that mattered to me was my daily bowl of soup, my crust of stale bread. The bread, the soup, those were my entire life. I was nothing but a bot body, perhaps even less a famished stomach. The stomach alone was measuring time. In the warehouse, I often worked next to a young French woman. We did not speak. She did not know German, and I did not understand French. I thought she looked Jewish, though she passed for Aryan. She was a forced labor inmate. One day, was I, when Eidek was venting his fury, I happened to cross his path. He threw himself on me like a wild beast, beating me in the chest on my head, throwing me to the ground and picking me up again, crushing me with ever more violent blows until I was covered in blood. As I bit my lips in order not to howl with pain, he must have mistaken my silence for defiance, and so he continued to hit me harder and harder. Abruptly, he calmed down and sent me back to work as if nothing had happened, as if we had taken part in a game in which both roles were of equal importance. I dragged myself to, the, to my corner. I was aching all over. I felt a cool hand wiping the blood from my forehead. It was the French girl. She was smiling her beautiful, excuse me, she was smiling her mournful smile as she slipped me a crust of bread. She looked straight into my eyes. I knew she wanted to talk to me, but that she was paralyzed with fear. She remained like that for some time, and then her face lit up, and she said, in almost perfect German, Bite your lips, little brother, don't cry. Keep your anger, your hate, for another day, for later. The day will come, but not now. Wait. Clench your teeth and wait. Many years later, in Paris, I sat in the metro, reading my newspaper. Across the aisle, a beautiful woman with dark hair and dreamy eyes. I had seen those eyes before. Madame, don't you recognize me? I don't know you, sir. In 1944, you were in Poland, in Buna, weren't you? Yes, but you worked in a depot, a warehouse for electrical parts. Yes, she said, looking troubled. And then, after a moment of silence, wait, I do remember. Eidek, the capo, the young Jewish boy, your sweet words. We left the metro together and sat down at a cafe terrace. We spent the whole evening reminiscing. Before parting, I said, may I ask you one more question? I know what it is. Am I Jewish? Yes. I am, from, a, from an observant family. During the occupation, I had false papers and passed as Aryan, and that was how I was assigned to a forced labor unit. When they deported me to Germany, I eluded being sent to a concentration camp. 
At the depot, nobody knew that I spoke German. It would have aroused suspicion. It was imprudent of me to say those few words to you, but I knew that you would not betray me. Another time, we were loading diesel motors in onto freight cars under the supervision of some German soldiers. Eidek was on the edge. He had trouble restraining himself. Suddenly, he exploded. The victim this time was my father. You old loafer, he started yelling. Is this what you call working? And he began beating him with an iron bar. At first, my father simply doubled over under the blows, but then he seemed to break into like an old tree struck by lightning. I had watched it all happening without moving. I kept silent. In fact, I thought... In fact, I thought of stealing away in order not to suffer the blows. What's more, if I felt anger at that moment, it was not directed at the kapo, but at my father. Why couldn't he have avoided Eidek's wrath? That was what life in a concentration camp had made of me. Frannick, the foreman, one day noticed a, the gold crown in my mouth. Let me have your crown, kid. I answered that I could not, because without that crown, I could no longer eat. For what they give you to eat, kid? I found another answer. My crown had been listed in the register during the medical checkup. This could mean trouble for both of us. If you don't give me your crown, it will cost you much more. All of a sudden, this pleasant and intelligent young man had changed. His eyes were shining with greed. I told him that I needed to get my father's advice. Go ahead, kid. Ask. But I want the answer by tomorrow. When I mentioned it to my father, he hesitated. After a long silence, he said, No, my son, we cannot do this. He will seek revenge. He won't dare, my son. Unfortunately, Frannick knew how to handle this. He knew my weak spot. My father had never served in the military and could not march in step. But here, whenever we moved from one place to another, it was in step. That presented Frannick with the opportunity to torment him and, on a daily basis, to thrash him savagely. Left, right, he punched him. Left, right, he slapped him. I decided to give my father lessons in marching in step and keeping time. We began practicing in front of our block. I would command, left, right, and my father would try. The inmates made fun of us. Look at the little officer teaching the old man to march. Hey, little general, how many rations of bread does the old man give you for this? But my father did not make sufficient progress, and the blows continued to rain on him. So, you still don't know how to march in step, you old good-for-nothing? This went on for two weeks. It was untenable. We had to give in. That day, Frannick burst into savage laughter. I knew it. I knew that I would win, kid. Better late than never. And because you made me wait, it will also, ca also cost you a ration of bread. A ration of bread for one of my pals, a famous dentist from Warsaw, to pay him for pulling out your crown. What? My ration of bread so that you can have my crown? Frannick smiled. What would you like, that I break your teeth by smashing your face? That evening, in the latrines, the dentist from Warsaw pulled my crown with the help of a rusty spoon. Frannick became pleasant again. From time to time, he even gave me extra soup. But it didn't last long. Two weeks later, all the poles were transferred to another camp. I had lost my crown for nothing. A few days before the Poles left, I had a novel experience. It was on a Sunday morning. Our commando was not required to work that day. Only Eidig would not hear of staying in the camp. We had to go to the depot. This sudden enthusiasm for work astonished us. At the depot, Eidig entrusted us to Frannick, saying, Do what you like, but do something, or else you'll hear from me. And he disappeared. We didn't know what to do. Tired of huddling on the ground, we each took turns strolling through the warehouse in the hope of finding something. A piece of bread, perhaps, that a civilian might have forgotten there. When I reached the back of the building, I heard sounds coming from a small adjoining room. I moved closer and had a glimpse of Eidek and a young Polish girl, half-naked, on a straw mat. Now I understood why Eidek refused to leave us in the camp. He moved 100 prisoners so that he could copulate with this girl. It struck me as terribly funny, and I burst out laughing. Eidek turned, or Eidek jumped, turned, and saw me while the girl tried to cover her breasts. I wanted to run away, but my feet were nailed to the floor. Eidek grabbed me by my throat. Hissing at me, he threatened, just you wait, kid. You will see what it costs to leave your work. You'll pay for this later. Now go back to your place. A half hour before the usual time to stop work, the capo assembled the entire commando. Roll call. Nobody understood what was going on. A roll call at this hour? Here? Only I knew. The capo made a short speech. An ordinary inmate does not have the right to mix into other people's affairs. One of you does not seem to have understood this point. I shall therefore try to make him understand clearly once and for all. I felt the sweat running down my back. A-7713, I stepped forward. A crate, he ordered. They brought a crate. Lie down on it, on your belly. I obeyed. I no longer felt anything except the lashes of the whip. One, two, he was counting. He took his time between lashes. On the first, only, only the first really hurt. I heard him count. Ten, eleven. His voice was calm and reached me as, the, as through a thick wall. Twenty-three. Two more, I thought, half, unco uh, half unconscious. 
The capo was waiting. 24, 25. It was over, but I, and I had not realized it, but I had fainted. I came to when they doused me with cold water. I was still lying on the crate. In a blur, I could see the wet ground next to me. Then I heard someone yell. It had to be the capo. I began to distinguish what he was shouting. Stand up. I must have made some movement to get up, but I felt myself fall back on the crate. How I wanted to get up. Stand up. He was yelling even more loudly. If only I could answer him. If only I could tell him that I could not move, but my mouth would not open. At Idik's command, two inmates lifted me and led me to him. Look me in the eye. I looked at him without seeing him. I was thinking of my father. He would be suffering more than I. Listen to me, you son of a swine, said Idik coldly. So much for your curiosity. You shall receive five times more if you dare tell anyone what you saw. Understood? I nodded. Once, ten times, endlessly, as if my head had decided to say yes for all eternity. One Sunday, as half of our group, including my father, was at work, the others, including me, took the opportunity to stay and rest. At around 10 o'clock, the sirens started to go off. Alert. The Black Autiste gathered us inside the blocks while the SS took refuge in the shelters. As it was relatively easy to escape during an alert, the guards left the watchtowers and the electric current in the barbed wire was cut. The standing order to the SS was that any was to shoot anyone who was fa anyone found outside his block. In no time, the camp had the look of an abandoned ship. No living soul in the alleys. Next to the kitchen, two cauldrons of hot, steaming soup had been left untended. Two cauldrons of soup, smack in the middle of the road. Two cauldrons of soup with no one to guard them. A royal feast going to waste. Supreme temptation. Hundreds of eyes were looking at them, shining with desire. Two lambs with hundreds of wolves lying in wait for them. Two lambs without a shepherd, free for the taking. But who would dare? Fear was greater than hunger. Suddenly, we saw the door of Block 37 open slightly. A man appeared, crawling snake-like in the direction of the cauldrons. F hundreds of eyes were watching at his every move. Hundreds of men were crawling with him, scraping their bodies with his on the stones. All hearts trembled, but mostly with envy. He was the one who had dared. He reached the first cauldron. Hearts were pounding harder. He had succeeded. Jealousy devoured us, consumed us. We never thought to admire him. Poor hero, committing suicide for a ration or two or more of soup. In our minds, he was already dead. Lying on the ground near the cauldron, he was trying to lift himself to the cauldron's rim. Either out of weakness or out of fear, he remained there, un undoubtedly to muster his strength. At last, he succeeded in pulling himself up to the rim. For a second, he seemed to be looking at himself in the soup, looking for his ghostly reflection there. Then, for no apparent reason, he let out a terrible scream, a death rattle such as I have never heard before, and with open mouth, thrust his head toward the still steaming liquid. We jumped at the sound of the shot. Falling to the ground, his face stained by the soup, the man writhed for a few seconds at the base of the cauldron, and then he was still. That was when we began to hear the planes. Almost at the same moment, the barrack began to shake. They're bombing the Buna factory, someone shouted. I anxiously thought of my father who was at work, but I was glad nevertheless. To watch that factory go up in flames? What revenge! While we had heard some talk of German military defeats on the various fronts, we were not sure if they were credible. But today, this was real. We were not afraid, and yet if a bomb had fallen on the blocks, it would have cl claimed hundreds of inmates' lives. But we no longer feared death, in any event, not this particular death. Every bomb that hit filled us with joy, gave us renewed confidence. The raid lasted more than one hour, if only it could have gone on for ten times ten hours. Then, once more, there was silence. The last sound of the American plane dissipated in the wind, and there we were, in our cemetery. On the horizon, we saw a long trail of black smoke. The sirens began to wail again. The end of the alert. Everyone came out of the blocks. We breathed in air filled with fire and smoke, and our eyes shone with hope. A bomb had landed in the middle of the camp near the apple flats, the assembly point, but had not exploded. We had to dispose of it outside the camp. The head of the camp, the Lagrotist, accompanied by his aide and the chief capo, were on an inspection tour of the camp. The raid had left traces of great fear on his face. In the very center of the camp lay the body of the man with soup stains on his face, the only victim. The cauldrons were carried back to the kitchen. The SS were back at their posts in the watchtowers behind their machine guns. Intermission was over. An hour later, we saw the commandos returning, in step, as always. Happily, I caught sight of my father. Several buildings were flattened, he said, but the depot was not touched. In the afternoon, we cheerfully went to clear the ruins. One week later, as we returned from work, there in the middle of the camp, in the apple flats, stood a black gallows. We learned that the soup would be distributed only after roll call, which lasted longer than usual. The orders were given more harshly than on other days, and there were strange vibrations in the air. Caps off, the lagrotiste suddenly shouted. Ten thousand caps came off at once. Cover your heads, 
10,000 caps were back on our heads at lightning speed. The camp gate opened. An SS unit appeared and encircled us. One SS every three paces. The machine guns on the watchtowers were pointed toward the apple plots. They're expecting trouble, whispered Juliet. Two SS were headed toward the solitary confinement cell. They came back, the condemned man between them. He was a young boy from Warsaw, an inmate with three years in concentration camps behind him. He was tall and strong, a giant compared to me. His back was to the gallows, his face turned toward his judge, the head of the camp. He was pale, but seemed more solemn than frightened. His manacled hands did not tremble. His eyes were coolly assessing the hundreds of SS guards, the thousands of prisoners surrounding him. The Lagartist began to read the verdict, emphasizing every word. In the name of Reich for Himmler, prisoner number stole during the air raid. According to the law, prisoner number is condemned to death. Let this be a warning and an example to all prisoners. Nobody moved. I heard the pounding of my heart. The thousands of people who died daily in Auschwitz and Birkenau in the crematoria no longer troubled me. But this boy leaning against his gallows upset me deeply. This ceremony, will it be over soon? I'm hungry, whispered Juliet. At the sign of the Lagartis, the Lager Capo stepped up to the condemned youth. He was assisted by two prisoners in exchange for two bowls of soup. The Capo wanted to blindfold the youth, but he refused. After what seemed like a long moment, the hangman put the rope around his neck. He was about to signal to his aides to pull the chain out from under the to pull the chair out from under the young man's feet when the latter shouted in a strong and calm voice. Long live liberty! My curse on Germany! My curse! My... The executioner had completed his work. Like a sword, the order cut through the, order cut through the air. Caps off. 10,000 prisoners paid their respects. Cover your heads. Then the entire camp, block after block, filed past the hanged boy and stared his, at his extinguished eyes, the tongue hanging from his gaping mouth. The coppos forced everyone to look him squarely in the face. Afterward, we were given permission to go back to our block and have our meal. I remember that on that evening, the soup tasted better than ever. I watched other hangings. I never saw a single, a single victim weep. Those with these withered bodies had long forgotten the bitter taste of tears. Except once. The Oberkapo of the 52nd Cable Commando was a Dutchman, a giant of a man, well over six feet. He had some 700 prisoners under his command, and they all loved him like a brother. Nobody had ever endured a blow or even an insult from him. In his service was a young boy, a pipa as they were called. This one had a delicate and beautiful face, an incredible sight in this camp. In Buna, the Paipala were hated. They often displayed greater cruelty than their elders. I often saw one, or I once saw one of them, a boy of 13, beat his father for not making his bed properly. As the old man quietly wept, the boy was yelling, if you don't stop crying instantly, I will no longer bring you bread. Understood? But the Dutchman's little servant was beloved by all. He, his was the face of an angel in distress. One day, the power failed at the central electric plant in Buna. The Gestapo, summoned to inspect the damage, concluded that it was sabotage. They found a trail. It led to the block of the Dutch Oberkapo, and after a search, they found a significant quantity of weapons. The Oberkapo was arrested on the spot. He was tortured for weeks on end in vain. He gave no names. He was transferred to Auschwitz and never heard from again. But his young Peppel remained behind in solitary confinement. He too was tortured, and he, but he too remained silent. The SS then condemned him to death, him and two other inmates who had been found to possess, possess arms. One day, as we returned from work, we saw three gallows, three black ravens erected on the apple plots. Roll call. The SS surrounding us, machine guns aimed at us. The usual ritual. Three prisoners in chains, and among them, the little people, Pipel the saddened, sad-eyed angel. The SS seemed more preoccupied, more worried than usual. To hang a child in front of thousands of onlookers was not a small matter. The head of the camp read the verdict. All eyes were on the child. He was pale, almost calm, but he was biting his lips as he stood in the shadow of the gallows. This time, the lager couple refused to act as ex executioner. Three SS took his place. The three condemned prisoners together stepped onto the chairs. In unison, the nooses were placed around their necks. Long live liberty, shouted the two men, but the boy was quiet, was silent. Where is merciful God? Where is he? Someone behind me was asking. At the signal, the three chairs were tipped over. Total silence in the camp. On the horizon, the sun was setting. Caps off, screamed the lagartiste. His voice quivered. As for the rest of us, we were weeping. Cover your heads. Then came the mat march past the victims. The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen and bluish. But the third rope was still moving. 
The child, too light, was still breathing. And so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, for God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice whisper, where he is, this is where, hanging here from the scallows. That night, the soup tasted of corpses.